word last week from um, Pastor Tim and as we were Ramsey on about fire. The Lord gave me a word today about fanning the flames. And I know that there's some, there's some of us here are, are not quite sure about what the fire is about and also what we can do to be part of what God wants in our lives. In Hebrews 12 verse 28 says, Therefore since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. The more, one of the most important words in those two verses there is the word for. Because verse 28, it means, verse 28 is because our God is a consuming fire. That's what that means. It says, it's this, this, and this, because our God is a consuming fire. God wants us to have a determination in our lives to serve Him. And He even describes how to do it. Acceptably, with reverence, with godly fear, and that's not scared, that's a godly fear where you want to do it right for God, because you love Him and respect Him. And it's said that grace is there to help us to do that. We have that grace to help us serve God, to do it acceptably, reverently and in godly fear. And then the fire, I believe in this is what that means, he said because our God is a consuming fire. If we can serve God in a really good way, it's because God's a consuming fire. Why? Because he'll burn up any dross and any rubbish that's in our lives or around us that might hinder us serving him. See what I mean? If there's some rubbish going on and, it, and you desperately want to serve God and there's something getting in your way, he will get rid of it. When the devil's having a go at you and you're crying out to God because you want to be close to him, you want to serve him, he will stop that immediately. So you can get on and serve him and do what you need to do. We've seen that so many times when there's been persecution and stuff going on, but the minute you step out to do it, all the persecution disappears. Why does it disappear? Because our God's a consuming fire and he's going to burn this stuff up. He's not having it. He just, he just doesn't want it. I mean, I've seen uh, examples of where you can get rid of uh, uh, weeds and things in between your paving stones with a great big blowtorch thing. You know, just burn it up. Just get rid of it completely. I've seen other examples where people can use fire to be a blessing like that. Well, this is how God is to be a blessing to us. When it comes to his own people, his consuming fire won't consume us. It'll consume anything that's stopping us receiving from him and ministering for him and serving him. Amen? That's what I like. And in a very similar scripture too in, um, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 97, it says, A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. There's a song, that, that's one of the verses to a, a song that we used to sing. A fire goes before him and burns up all his enemies. I know that God doesn't want his enemies to stop people, his own people, being blessed. If there's going to be enemies, God is going to find a way of stopping them. And here it says, a fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about him. If the fire goes before him and we want to be blessed by this aspect of his uh, ability to bless us and protect us, we've got to be with him. If you're not with him when the fire's going before him to get rid of the enemies, if you're still off in the flesh doing your own thing, you're going to have to protect yourself. And the Lord showed me this is why a lot of Christians find the Christian walk difficult because they're always trying to have to protect themselves. Why you're having to protect yourself is because you're not in the right place. There's God here fighting off the enemies and burning them all up in front of him and you're off there in the midst of the other enemies. And I've often seen a picture of, of people, Christians complaining that it's, pour, it's always raining on them, it's always pouring down on somebody, always getting soaking wet and God's over there with an umbrella. 
you know, and you're just not in the right place. We have to be in the right place with him. So him to be able to protect us from these enemies. Not just protect us, but get rid of them completely. God wants to do some stuff in our lives and this is the only way he's going to do it. In Acts 2, 1, we mentioned this last week too. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they, began, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now most of us recognise what that is, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you need to have that baptism in your life to be able to to bless you and to receive your blessing. But the disciples were in exactly the right place because he said, now go into Jerusalem and wait. When you get there, wait together and the promise of the Father will be given to you. The Spirit will come upon you and you will receive this. And you'll be baptised with the Holy Ghost and fire. And they were in the right place. And the fire came. The fire came to 120 people. There weren't 120 of Jesus' disciples there. He didn't have that many of actual close disciples. These were just people who joined the, joined the team, part of Jesus' ministry team now. They weren't the main disciples. You don't have to be one of the main disciples or ministers or pastors or evangelists or anything. You just have to be a member of the body of Christ. And you can have this fire, and you can have this Holy Ghost come on you as well. Amen? John said, Jesus will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They will both come together. You know, the devil fights the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then one of the reasons he fights the baptism of the Holy Spirit it's because he can't understand when you're praying in tongues. He doesn't like that. He wants to stop you doing that. So the only way you can pray is in English or in your native language, which he can understand. He can't understand tongues. But the other reason he fights it is because we are baptised with the Holy Ghost and fire. And he doesn't like us having fire where he's concerned. Whether the devil believes it or not, he actually knows what it says at the end of the Bible. I don't think he believes it, but he knows what it says at the end of the Bible. So he's fighting the fire, he's fighting anything that might come into our lives that's going to stop us being that blessing, in Jesus' name. Well, we're not having it, are we? We're not having his stopping through things, we're going to have the best we can possibly have. In John 9 verse 5, Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Is Jesus here now, in the world? No, he's not. He's, go, he's gone to heaven, he's, he's inhabiting heaven, and he's inhabiting the children of God. He's not in the world anymore. He's not down here ministering anymore. As long as I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. And then it says in Matthew 5.14, talking to the disciples, including us, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus was certainly the light of the world while he was here ministering and now it's our job. It's our job to be that light of the world. So I believe we can realise that God is doing this for us to bless us. He's saying you are the light of the world. We are not the light of the church. We are not the light of the believers. We're not the light of any denomination. We are the light of the world. So where should be shining our light? In the world. Yes, you can see our light in church, and you can see the people, when you go to big conferences and stuff, you can see the people who are on fire for God. You recognise them immediately, and you look at other people, and you think, you could do with some fire in your life. Now, I think a lot of people have not realised that when you're reading the New Testament, you're reading about things that happened a couple of thousand years ago. And they forget. The word fire and the word light, they're using the same word here. You're the light of the world. 
comes from the word phobos. Phos, not phobos. Phos, as in phosphorus. Something that's glowing. Something that's shining. Something that's on fire. Now, of course, you know what when the Whenever they, they, they had problems at night time, of course, you know, they, whenever they wanted to go anywhere, they just switched their torches on, didn't they? Or they got their little iPhone now, and they pressed the little button, and you got the light. No! What did they have for lights back then? Lamps, candles, torches. What were they all powered by? Fire. Nobody had a light that wasn't powered by fire. When you said light, you also meant fire. You couldn't have one without the other. A friend of mine, uh, part of the Rotary Club, has for oh, the past, past 15, 20 years been ministering in Africa. And one of the big things he's been trying to do is encourage the people there to buy the, save up a bit of money and buy one of these solar lamps from him. Of really, really cheap, silly prices. Uh, but he wants them to, to save the money up because when they've saved the money up and bought this thing, the money they've been saving, they can keep saving and use it on other things because now they won't be using kerosene. If you've got a lamp in your little hut or your little house and you're using kerosene, you are in danger. See, fire can be dangerous as well as illuminating and you can cook with it, you can light a light with it, but it can burn you to death. So he's been doing that for years, trying to get these people to encourage them to come away from kerosene lamp because they're dangerous. So if you're not in the sort of first world work light area, the only light you're going to have is from fire. The candle has got a fire. A lamp, an oil lamp has got a fire. A, a torch that you might use out in the open, it's got a fire. So we have to remember that every time we're talking about light, we're also talking about fire automatically. Would you agree with that? You are the fire of the world. It brings light, but first it's fire. It's not light first. You know, you can put a, I, I can switch my little iPhone on now, and, I, and we've got these lights up here. There's no fire involved, thank God. Yeah, just light. Yes, there's something electrical going on, but there's no fire going on. It's just light. Back then, you couldn't have light without fire. So when Jesus said, I'm, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, he also meant, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the fire of the world. And I'm, my fire is going to go everywhere, and wherever it goes, it brings light. Your fire should go everywhere, and wherever you go, it brings light. What does light mean? The light is the revelation of Jesus Christ to the world to tell them what the truth is about things. So we've got to realize now, we are the light of the world. You are the only source of God's light and God's fire in this world, the Christians are. Nobody else has got it. The Jews haven't got it. The Arabs haven't got it. Nobody else has got it. We've got it. We have been given that task, that job. We've been given that light. We've been given that power to go into the world and be a light. And being a light means that when people talk to you about Christianity or the subject comes up, you talk about it. Like Caroline said, you can be bold about it. You just tell people. You don't have to be scared of them. They're already scared of you. They are. The people in the world, one of the biggest things, I said on Tuesday night when we were talking with the people in Chippenham, one of the biggest scary things that people have is, if I accept what you're saying about God and give my life to Jesus, I've been wrong all these years. Poor, what, me? Wrong? Poor, no, I'm not having that, so I'll stay where I am, thank you very much. They're scared of admitting they've been wrong. But I said to the people, if you haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord of, your, Lord of your life yet, yes, you are wrong. There's something in your life you need to change. You need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Because we're that light. We are that light to shine in people's in, in lives. In Luke chapter 12, verse 30, 35, this is a big, long uh, passage in this chapter about the end times. 
what's going to happen when, when Jesus comes back, you're going to be in the field, you're going to be in the mill, what are you going to be doing? He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. Let your waist be girded means tuck up the bottom of the skirts of the hem of your garment, tuck it into your belt, so that when Jesus says go, you can run. That's what that means. When your waist, your loins be girded, it means that you can tuck up your robes into your waist, into your belt, and you can run as fast as you need to. And your lamps, what are they doing? Burning. Not just lit, your lamps burning, ready. Remember the, the, the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins? What was that all about? Can you light your light or can't you light your light? Did you bother buying any oil? Did you bother getting any oil from God so that when, when the bridegroom comes you can go, whoa, let's put a torch to that, let's light that one up. And of course nobody had any matches in those days. You might have had a little uh, a flint I think they had them back there, you could, you could start a fire with a flint, but generally no. You had to have a light to have a light. If you had a light and your friend had a light, but his wasn't lit yet, you had to use yours to light his. You've done that yourself, haven't you, on candles, on, on birthday cakes. You, you, you lit one, and then you've got the other one, you, you go lighting all the other ones. And then you drop bits of wax on the top of the cake, and you think, I wish I'd used a match now. You see, <clears throat> we've got to be ready. He wants us to be ready to run, and when we're running, we've got our fire lit in our lamp, ready. We've got that fire. When Jesus takes us to do a work for him, do you think he'll direct us to a nice, bright, shiny place, or in a dark place? He's going to take us to a dark place. That's where he's going to take us. He doesn't want to shine in the light, you know, you don't normally go into a, a born-again, spirit-filled church and start preaching about getting born again. No, you do that in the world. He's encouraging us to go into the world as this bright, shiny light with our fire and shine God's fire and his light into the place so that people can change themselves and get from darkness to light. When we go into this darkness, we go into the world and we shine. We should shine when we go into the world because people should see that we're different. I mean, no, no matter how it simple it is, it's like the, the other, yeah, uh, when was it now? Yeah, yesterday morning I went into town to pick up a couple of bouquets of flowers. And uh, it was a bit rainy, a little just drizzly, so the lady said to me, uh, do you want to just take one and come back from the other one? I said, no, I can carry them both like this. So, so where are you? I'm just I parked just down. Oh, you were left to get a parking space there. I said, oh, I cheat. This is how I use this. Said, how do you, I mean you cheat? I said, oh, I pray. You pray? I said, yeah, I pray and say, Lord, I need that parking space just outside the car shop, please, because that's just the right place to walk across the road to the flower shop. You can't park anywhere near the flower shop, so that's the closest space. And I got it. Oh, she said, hmm. <laughs> I shone a little bit of light. I lit my fire. Well, I had my fire lit already. And I shone a bit of light into her life. She's thought about that. You can pray and ask God for a parking space. I said, somebody said to me once when I told them that, you think God's got nothing better to do than find a parking space for you? I said, he's got lots of other things to do, but when I ask him to do it, he will do it for me. If you ask him to do it, he'll do it for you. I got fed up of driving around looking for parking spaces. Absolutely fed up of it. And even when I did find one, it wasn't in the right place. So I actually tell God which space I would like. I would like the one over just in front of the, the animal feed shop there, please, because I'm just going to go through and get a haircut. And I go up there and somebody pulls out and I pull in. <laughs> Did that in London, going to, going to visit the House of the Parliament and uh, we needed a parking space and our friend said this is probably the road, he told us the name of this road, probably the best place you can park, right near the House of the Parliament, it's got on, on street metre parking, you should be okay there. We get there, every space was full, every single space was full. 
But just as we almost got to the end of the road and the last but one car pulls out, we pull straight in. <laughs> perfect, isn't it? Even more perfect than that was when we got out and looked at the meter, it was broken. <laughs> With a big sign on it saying, sorry, you won't be able to pay us today. This meter is faulty. God wants to look after us. When there's enemies coming our way and things going on, I don't know what scared that guy and made him want to drive out of his parking space then, but he did, he left immediately and I drove in. Have you ever been driving behind somebody who's driving a bit erratic? You go, please Lord, can they turn off at the next turning please? <laughs> <laughs> you know, God wants to do some stuff in our lives. In James 3, I just want to look at something here where sometimes you have to realise that fire isn't always good. Fire is not always good. In James 3, 5 it says, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. Did you realise that? The tongue is set on fire by hell, it says. The human tongue. It can spread negatives like wildfire. Because it's lit by hell. I was in Arborfield with the army a long time ago. And uh, it had been a very, very dry summer. And uh, we were called upon to go and help the fire brigade. Uh, the fire brigade had gone into the local forests and put the fires out. But we had to go behind the firefighters and rake up all the cinders in between the trees. Everywhere there were, if there was any smoke, we knew there was something there. If there wasn't, rake the cinders. To rake the cinders, to get some air to the bits that are underneath, because if there was anything there that was still hot enough to ignite, we wanted rid of it. We do. We only had little buckets of water, but we didn't need much of a bucket of water just to put out a tiny little bit of fire. And we were raking. But the thing was that sometimes you would rake it, and before you get your bit of water to it, it would burst into flames. Because all you'd done is rake it a little bit and let the air get to it, whoosh, up in fire again. And we got pretty filthy dirty for a few days that we were doing that. But we did it. But I did notice that it didn't take much, like that scripture said, a tiny little spark hidden away that nobody can see. You rake it a bit and get some air to it and whoosh, there's the flame. And if we hadn't done something about it, it would have started the fire off again. When we look at the fire of God, just a tiny spark from you is a big problem for the enemy. A tiny glimmer of fire and light coming from you, the enemy gets really scared. Because he's concerned, he knows he's going to get burnt up in the end. He thinks, I hope, whoa, hope it's not coming now. Let's find a way of stopping these people. And he tries. But every one of you, and I'm including myself here, every one of you as believers, if you are in a situation like you are now, you haven't been thinking much about the fire of God or anything, if you're raked over a little bit with a bit of enthusiasm and then a bit of grace blows in you'll be on fire because that ember is already inside you you are the fire of the world it just takes a little spark, just a little bit of glowing a little bit of somebody encouraging you a little bit of somebody saying yeah come on let's do this together let's get involved in this fire stuff and you'll be burning. What happens when you start burning? When you go places, you light the place up. You light the place up and people see that you're a bit different. And they ask you, well, why, what's the matter with you? You're different to everybody else. We've had, Pastor Janet and I have had that happen to us lots of times. When we go somewhere, and just the way we're behaving, what we're saying, what we're doing, they go, what is, what is it about you? Why are you different? You know, like, when you... Um, when you buy something from somebody and you get, or yeah, you buy something from somebody and you give them the money 
and there's, it's, it's short of money, would they say to you, um, you know, you haven't given me enough money? Well, when we were receiving some money off somebody one time, they gave us too much. And we said, okay, we told them, here, you gave us 20 quid too much. And they said, oh, that's very kind of you. Most people wouldn't have done that. And we said, yeah, but we're Christians. That's why we do that. On another occasion, I got some money out of the bank, or Pastor Janet had got some money out of the bank to pay somebody for something for a hundred pounds. And the bank had inadvertently given her six 20 pound notes. So when it get, I opened the envelope, the guy said, oh, well, there's 120 here. I said, oh, I'll have that spare one back. It, the, bank must have given us the wrong money. He said, well, it's the bank's fault. I said, yes, I know, but the teller's got a problem now because the till didn't count. So I'm going to get, you're going to take the money back to the bank when the bank made a mistake and they don't know you've got it? I said, yes. Why? Shine a bit of light there. Being a bit of fire there. Number of times that people in, in the sort of job I was doing in the secular world for a while after I left the army, they were happy for you to lie about things. You know when I ring up the office and say, look, I'm at this comprehensive school here in Bridgewater and uh, it's a big place. They say, yeah, I know it is. And it needs two people. And they're concerned that, you know, there should have been two people here and they'd only allocated me. Yeah? Or tell them, tell them there were supposed to be two, but one of them called me and said, I'm not telling them that. So why not? I said, because it's not true. I said, you can tell them that if you like. Yeah, I'll give you the phone, you can tell them. I'm not going to tell them that. You've got to be careful. Don't be sucked into doing things the normal world's way. Why not? Because that's darkness. It's not fire. It's not being on fire for God. Don't be sucked into that at all. So here we are. We've got to, re to realise that we are capable of just bursting into flames just with a little bit of the enthusiasm from somebody and a little bit of grace, we'll get there. But I'll tell you something else too, just to close off with this. In Ephesians 6.16, 6, so 6, talking about the armour, it says that above all, do you think that sounds like important? Yeah? Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We know that scripture, don't we? Our shield of faith is an impenetrable barrier to enemy fire. Okay? But the key is, you've got to link that with that scripture we read in James. A lot of people seem to think that these fiery darts are aimed at your mind to get you thinking wrong. They're not. What does it say in James? Your tongue is set on fire by hell. The fiery darts are aimed at your tongue so you will speak the words of the devil. You will speak the negatives. Sometimes you can think something negative and still speak positive. Would you agree? Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can feel, oh, God, my leg does not hurt. I'm healed by his stripes. You, know, you can think, my leg hurts, but you speak, by his stripes I'm healed. Amen? You can think, oh, God, that's a big bill. I don't know if you've got enough money in the bank to cover that, but you speak, uh, my God supplies all my need according to his riches in glory. You see, the devil wants you to speak his way of thinking about things and his way of doing things. So the fiery darts are aimed at your tongue, not at your mind. Can you see that? Because the tongue is set on fire by hell if it's not being ruled by God. So instead, we speak the words of faith, the words of the Bible. Faith doesn't just stop the fiery darts. That would be good if it did. It doesn't just stop them. It extinguishes them. Quench. You quench your fire by pouring water on it or taking away all the oxygen from it. It extinguishes the fire. Amen? Faith means the devil cannot get you to speak negatively because you've got this shield of faith where anything coming that way that's negative gets quenched and put out and all you come, uh, is coming out of your mouth is words of faith. Words of faith, words of faith. So you can then boldly say 
if Jesus wants my lamp lit and burning that's what he's going to get because I serve him would you agree with that? let's boldly say that together if Jesus wants my lamp lit and burning then that's what he's going to get because I serve him and when you determine to serve him like that the grace of God comes in to help you serve him and the, con the consuming fire of God will burn up all the enemies round about so you can do it isn't that good? I love the fact that God wants us to be encouraged to do something because this next uh, screen I've got putting up here this is my vision of FCF now oh, I've done it again put that picture up and forgot to take the little tick out of a box there's the picture of Foundation Christian Fellowship on fire Amen. all of us all of us on fire for God and how are we going to be on fire for God we're going to keep our shield up we're going to stop these fiery darts coming in and get it to speak negative and we're going to allow our light to shine which means we've got fire going on as well and we're going to illuminate the place wherever we go and people are going to get saved and set free and healed and delivered Amen? Amen, Amen. Thank you Lord <laughs>